to uh, dedicate today's show to the memory of Kendrick Castillo, the boy at the school in Colorado who jumped on the shooter, on the murderer, gave, and saved lives, gave precious time. Others then tackled him afterwards, saved lives, and he got killed. Kendrick Castillo. A a big problem on on Earth has always been that the bad kill the good. So you... You have in every generation a certain percentage of good people, often the best, are killed. And the uh, the bad are also killed on occasion, obviously. But it's it's a I think the ratio works against us. I look at this uh, Kendrick Castillo's face and I my heart breaks. I love I love people who fight for good. He was he, he was a fighter. Man I have admired for many years is Myron Magnet. And he is editor at large for Manhattan Institute City Journal, which I consider to be perhaps the most important conservative journal. There are many important ones, but this might be Primus Inter Paris, first among equals. And his new book is Clarence Thomas and the Lost Constitution. Myron Magnet, welcome to the Dennis Prager Show. Well, I am so delighted and honored to be with you, Dennis. Wow, that's very sweet of you to say. What is it, the old line, like a woman says, ah, I'll bet you say that to all the talk show hosts. You don't no, have to. So no, you're, 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 you're the top. <laughs> no, the no. <laughs> I wasn't. I truly wasn't looking for a compliment. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, ah, oh, you're the most beautiful. I'll bet you say that to all the ladies. <laughs> anyway, it, it really, this is so important. The uh, and, and you write in completely clear English. Folks, uh, You know, I won't say I won't say what I'm about to say. I'll ask you, how would you rank Clarence Thomas in the justices of the Supreme Court historically? Well, certainly up there in the top five, I would say Uh, he's he's heroic. This guy, he really is. He has understood that he's got a world historical task at hand. He's come to understand that in the years since his tumultuous and horrible confirmation hearings in 1991. But what he understands is that the framers in 1787 and then in the Bill of Rights and the the Civil War amendments gave us an unexampled form of government. They wanted to leave men free to forge their own happiness in their own way, in their own families, in their own communities. They did not want people to be ruled. They wanted us to be able to rule ourselves in democratic fashion by representatives we ourselves had elected. Now, when people say, well, how can we be governed by a 230-year-old document? It seems to me that the answer to that is that there is no more modern idea of government than the idea of self-government. That prig, Woodrow Wilson, thought that he had something that was much more up-to-date than that. He thought, okay, we're going to, you know, the founders are these antique figures in wigs. We're going to have something much different. We're going to have government by experts. We're going to have the Supreme Court sitting as a permanent constitutional convention that's going to make up law in Darwinian fashion to meet changing, evolving circumstances. Well, you know, his model was the German philosophers who admired Frederick the Great. In other words, this is the philosophy of of benevolent despotism. And the trouble with benevolent despotism, of rule by expert and well-meaning and supposedly non-political ex- experts, is that the Enlightenment tends to evaporate, leaving only the despotism. And that's kind of where we are now and where Cl- Clarence Thomas sees us 
now. And you can take the example of that, you know, just right now, this moment, this case in Montana. Um, some guy up in the mountains has a teeny rivulet going through his acres, and he thinks, well, I'll dig a couple of ponds. He digs a couple of ponds. Suddenly, the EPA is down on him like a ton of bricks and fines him $130,000 and sentences him to 18 months in federal prison. And all of this without any judge appointed under Article 3 of the Constitution, without any anything constitutional, a guy is going to prison and being fined not a trivial amount of money this is just star chamber despotism. So anybody who thinks that Woodrow Wilson's living constitution and government by decrees from judges and experts is an advance on the framers constitution of liberty. I'll finish that sentence. Needs to read your book. We'll be back in a moment. Clarence Thomas and the Lost Constitution. Myron Magnet is up at DennisPrager.com. Tell you some of the uh, descriptions of Prager U at uh, left-wing sites. They reconf- these people don't understand. They reconfirm for me all of my beliefs about the epic battle we're having, the civil war of values in the Western world and in America. It's, it's lost in Europe, or at least Western Europe. America's up for grabs. One of my favorite writers is Myron Magnet. He has just written a brief, totally clear, compelling book, Clarence Thomas and the Lost Constitution. I want to review with you. I, I didn't know about this Montana case. Is it now before the Supreme Court? Could you put on uh, my guest? I'm not hearing him. I, I mean, I pro- probably, probably, probably drove him to to an earlier grave than it would have done. Um, Wait, you know but, what? We, uh, we, I missed the opening. The, 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 uh, the oh, line wasn't on. So I I'm asked sorry. you, is, uh, no, it's not you, it's us. What, uh, so is it before the Supreme Court? No, it's not. Uh, the, the poor victim of this oppression died, driven no doubt into an earlier grave by some uh, whippersnapper administrative judge. And this, you know, all of this happened outside of Article Three of the Constitution. All of this was uh, all, here, here's here's the problem. Um, what happened in the New Deal was that not only did FDR supersize the idea of letting the court of having the court sit as a permanent constitutional convention allowing the executive and the Congress to do whatever it wanted to do. But also, the court stood by while he set up this vast administrative system in which unelected bureaucrats make laws like legislators, carry them out like executives, and and adjudicate and punish infractions of them like judges. It is just not self-government. Okay, so again, I, this is so important to me. I, uh, this is... This is about as scary a, a, a case as I have uh, heard, and I report this stuff every day. I just want to review a man in Montana. I, I didn't even understand. Does this have to do with wetlands? What? What? Oh. Yes, yes. Now, Montana is not wet. Montana is in the mountains. This guy has this teeny little rivulet flowing through his mountain acres, and he... he has dug uh, two little ponds up there. And the EPA, now these are just... Wait, 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 wait. Forgive me. Before the EPA, I don't understand why making ponds is, is a, an imprisonable offense. It's not. Except that you have the EPA acting like a legislature making a rule called Waters of the United States that says you cannot pollute a navigable waterway of the United States. Well, the nearest thing that comes, come, approaches a navigable waterway is 40 or 50 miles from this guy's land. But nevertheless, there's nobody to oversee the EPA except the, except the EPA. So some bureaucrat 
decides that digging these two holes in the ground constitutes an offense against this this law in all in all but name it's really just an administrative rule so it has no constitutional basis whatever and some administrative law judge miscalled the judge right in front of an administrative law court miscalled the court this is not an article 3 court under the constitution imposes these penalties on the guy this is wait was there a tr- was there a start- trial yeah, there's a, there's a hearing. So he and, there's a and, hearing. And, there's and no he, jury, no jury, no indictment. I mean, this is all right. This so is what? what okay, the okay. American colonists rebelled against. I totally, uh, totally on board. I I want to understand though what. So what is the objection of the people like us that could be brought before any court, including the Supreme Court? What is our case? Our case is that this is unconstitutional, and the guy uh, did have, I forget now which conservative legal foundation, was bringing an appeal to a real court, to a real federal court, to say that the EPA did not have the authority to do this. And then we'd have to see if the court would stand up to... All right, so let me let, let me, let me put it in a... a, a Let me go to the absurd, although there is no longer, as I said to my listeners a long time ago, you cannot lampoon the left because there's nothing left. But let me just understand, as an example, let us say the EPA decides that meat eating, which is their claim, meat eating way increases the carbon footprint, correct? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. That's what they say. So fine. So let us say the EPA passes a rule that no no individual can eat more than the following an amount uh, of meat per month what under the clean air act I under the uh, fine no no or or any no any carbon legislation i mean or or to, Absolutely. yes the exa- okay of methane. so yeah. yes exactly so yeah and let us say so is this uh, is this exactly equivalent to the montana case so that yes. if if they would say dennis prager you ate too much meat in February, and uh, and flatulated. Okay, well they the that they, all right. Well they can't they can't know that they can only infer that. But right. so let let us say that whatever the reason, they can then do to me what they did to the man in Montana. Yeah, they can. So we are bringing before the court the notion that this is this this is unconstitutional. You can't have the bureaucracy arrest you you know this is even pre-constitutional this is the stuff that the that the american colonists were standing up uh, standing up against in 1735 in the 1760s this is just plain tyranny just plain tyranny and people hold it up all right so this is and this is what you advance and this is what you explain in clarence thomas and the lost constitution among other things this is what this is what clarence thomas has devoted his life to fighting okay folks the book is up at dennisprager.com thank you myron mack the dennis prager show Uh, but uh a, a masculine man does what's right You're listening to Kirby Nation, the podcast of the Kirby Wilbur Show. Today we have as our guest Myron Magnet. Myron is the editor in chief of City of uh, City Journal. He was the editor at one time. He's written several books, including uh, Founders at Home, talking about the founding fathers and how they lived, and also The Dream and the Nightmare, talking about the '60s and the '70s, how social policy there uh, really kind of messed us up going down in, into later years. His latest book is called Clarence Thomas and the Lost. Constitution, a great book, highly recommend. And Myron, thank you so much for taking time with us today. Oh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Kirby. 
Myron, let's um, let's start out with kind of the basics. Clarence Thomas is considered by many an originalist. What is an originalist when it comes to the Constitution? Well, an originalist is a man who believes that we are governed by uh, by the words on the page as the founders wrote them, and as the state ratifying conventions and their contemporaries understood them. And what you know, so so you would immediately say, well, wait a minute, this is a 230-year-old document. Why do we want to still be governed by such an old thing? And the answer that Clarence Thomas would give would be double. Um, It would be that if the framers had wanted a constitution that evolves in Darwinian fashion as Woodrow Wilson had wanted it to do with the judges sitting as a permanent constitutional convention making up laws as they went along. They could have just stuck with the unwritten English one that had governed the American colonies for 150 years before the 1787 constitutional convention. But they wanted a written one that had everything cast in concrete because they had an extremely modern idea. And it remains the most modern governing idea that you can possibly have, namely that government exists to protect individuals from the aggressive aggressive nature of others, both foreign and domestic, but that the people who run the government have the same human nature as everybody else, and they too have a tendency to want to aggrandize power and can turn from the servants of the people into their masters so that you end up with an elective despotism, which is what the founders feared. Now, I don't know any idea that is more shiny and new than the idea of being left free to govern yourselves and to work out your own happiness in your own way, in your own family, in your own community. Well, you mentioned in the book, um, talking about Clarence Thomas's proposed constitution, you mentioned that you have the the first segment of American history, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and then the Reconstruction Amendments, if you will, under Abraham Lincoln, 13th, 14th, and 15th. And then there's all of a sudden a break at that point in legal theory or the Constitution leading up with Woodrow Wilson and the progressives. You mentioned Jim Crow, how the Jim Crow laws were passed after Reconstruction to really, I think, re-enslave the the recently freed blacks, just went against that that constitutional grain that the founders and Lincoln seem to be the upholders of, and Thomas seems to be uh, a student of that school and a a respecter of. Well, yeah, and he recounts that history, actually, in what I think is his best opinion, McDonald v. Chicago. Uh, And what what happened is that, uh, uh, so, okay, nearly 400,000 men, Union soldiers, died to make men fray. Um, And the Congress passed those amendments you mentioned, and the 14th Amendment gives to freed slaves and indeed to all American citizens all the privileges and immunities of U.S. citizenship. Well, two 1870s Supreme Court decisions just gutted that idea and said that, you know what, actually those are privileges and immunities that don't come from the Bill of Rights, Those are privileges and immunities that really are limited to such things as the right to travel on interstate waterways or not to be subject to bills of attainder. But in fact, what what the 14th Amendment aimed to do was to protect freed slaves from any deprivation of their liberties by state legislatures. And once the Supreme Court had taken away that protection, then the states were free to impose all the Jim Crow laws, mm-hmm. which had the effect of putting freedmen back into serfdom. And by the way, which still were in operation when Clarence Thomas mm-hmm. was a child growing up mm-hmm. in Savannah, Georgia. Um, so he says, look at, I know what it's like to live under state-sponsored oppression because there were water fountains I couldn't drink out of. There were parks I couldn't walk, walk through. All the schools were segregated. There were libraries that I couldn't go to. Um, so he's, he is very clear that government isn't, by definition, an instrument of benevolence and good, but that you always have to protect yourself against, against tyranny, and the Constitution is the, 
most radical, up-to-date, modern instrument to provide that protection against tyranny from rulers. When you discuss his upbringing in the book, how it influenced him, you use a couple different instances. I remember there's one part of the book where he's giving a speech, and he said, I wouldn't say we were off the grid. We were never on the grid because of the, <laughs> the substandard conditions they lived in. Uh, no, no, no power, no indoor plumbing. Uh, his grandfather, uh, being a sharecropper or a farmer, and another phrase he said that really struck me, you talk, he talked about his grandfather appreciating the fruits of his labor. And that brought back to me Lincoln in his stance against slavery. He really never argued that blacks and whites were equal. He argued that black men had the same right to the fruits of their labor as white men did. And that was a key point of his case against slavery. And here Thomas uses the same phraseology to talk about his grandfather's pride, the fruits of his labor. Well, you know, and of course, what what Lincoln understood and uh, what Thomas understands, and, and I mean, Thomas understands it just kind of it's in his it's in his veins, you know. But uh, uh, he also he also studied the uh, West Coast version of Straussian political theory, uh, which says essentially, look. Okay, we know that the Constitution makes, you know, the Constitution talks about slaves being counted as three-fifths of a man in the enumeration for representation. So this is something that people who don't like the Constitution use to to dismiss and belittle it and to say, oh, well, it's just a document preserving the, the, the rights of, of slaveholders. No, actually, what Clarence Thomas would say is that the founders knew perfectly well that slaveholder Thomas Jefferson was right to say that all men are created equal and endowed with certain rights um, equally. Um, it's just that if they wanted to get the Constitution ratified in a nation that was half slave, they could not summarily abolish slavery or, or else the South wouldn't sign it. So they had to hedge it around, and you know that three-fifths business was a compromise. Um, so <laughs> as for Clarence Thomas being off the grid, that's a, that's a very interesting story that bears on another big point that I make in the book, which is for Clarence Thomas, it is clear that he believes that it takes a certain kind, takes not just a wonderful constitution such as the framers gave us, um, but it also, also takes a certain kind of individual and national character to be capable of liberty, and it takes a culture that nurtures that character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's Clarence Thomas who grows up poor in Georgia. His mother can't afford to keep him and his little brothers, so she farms them out to her father, who is a self-made, if semi-literate, uh, founder and proprietor of a very modest fuel oil delivery company in Savannah. And he puts the boys to work delivering oil after school and on weekends. And, he, and, he, and in the summers, he takes them to the 60 acres that the family owns. Interestingly and ironically, just across from where the family had been, where their ancestors had been enslaved, um, and they build a house, um, and they break, uh, they clear the fields, they till them, they raise the crops, they harvest them, they butcher the animals for their winter food, and they do this summer after summer after summer. So, and meanwhile, grandfather is 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 uh, urging them on with such things as where there's a will, there's a way. Um, so these are, you know, these kids learn self-reliance the hard way. Um, and they really did come to depend on themselves, but they also learned that there really was that that you really could do anything that you set set your mind to, and much more than Clarence Thomas would ever imagined as a boy growing up in a segregated school in Savannah, Georgia. Imagine we have in our lifetimes the story of a kid growing up in a kerosene lit shanty in a Georgia swamp ending up on the Supreme Court bench. So this yeah. still is the old America. Only in America. We're talking to Myron Magnet. He is the editor-in-chief of City Journal, which is one conservative magazine I really recommend that you read.
Uh, it's a journal mostly on urban and economic policy, but it's a great read. Some great people write for it. He is the new author of the book just out today, I believe, Clarence Thomas and the Lost Constitution, talking about Clarence Thomas, his worldview, where it came from, how it's impacted the court. Um, you talk in the in the book about um, the great man uh, theory of history, that America used to emulate heroes, that we used to look at heroes, and when the 60s and 70s come, we kind of go to the anti-hero, where we are the victim of external forces over which we have no control, and that shapes history. Thomas obviously believes in the great man theory of history, the idea that people can change, people have free will, they can finally change their future, and they're not simply the victims of external forces. How does that impact his approach to the Constitution and decisions come up before the court, or does it? Well, I think he has utter contempt for that court decision that says that uh, welfare is a property right, which you can't be deprived of without a full-scale hearing. Mm -hmm. Um, Actually, your neighbors do not owe you a living. Um, A free people requires everybody to be self-reliant unless there's some kind of terrible external circumstance that makes you crippled or sick in some way. Um, But, uh, uh, you know, it was one of the ways in which the Constitution got distorted from the progressive era through the New Deal um, was the idea that the we little individual um, was could not stand against the great forces of the capitalist corporation or modernity or whatever, and it needed a great, enormous government to protect him from it. Um, and Clarence Thomas would say, well, no, actually that isn't so. People were able to band together to form unions, for example, um, People even, you know, pe- people were able to band together to uh, to agitate for civil rights, which they got. And so now, after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, anybody in America of all races um, can go out and no matter how difficult and adverse the circumstances may be that you face in your life, you can overcome them if you have the grit and, determ- and the determination to do so, because America and its constitutional framework gives you the freedom to do that. You mentioned in the book that Thomas has often written about his youth uh, with the King assassination in 1968, followed by Bobby Kennedy, that he actually lost faith in his religion, in his country, and his future because of the darkness of the of the late 60s and what had happened to Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy and others, and the cast around him. Yet he came through that and turned out to be a pretty f- devout Christian and a firm conservative. What brought him back? What was it that got him out of the depression, if you will, uh, the sadness, uh, the rejection of, of faith and country because of the tragedy of the assassinations, back to being who he is today? Well, I mean, let's not minimize just uh, just what that did to him. He went through a real phase of black radicalism when he was an undergraduate at Holy Cross, mm-hmm. uh, and and uh, he went around talking about how they, uh, how he and his black fellow students were aggrieved and victimized by a culture irretrievably tainted by racism. Uh, they had this uh, uh, attitude of uh, of opposition. He was reading and spouting Malcolm X in those days. And he went uh, at the end of his uh, junior year in college to a demonstration in support of our political prisoners, the uh, Black Panther murderers. Uh, And uh, he he drove to Cambridge, Mass. with a bunch of uh, classmates to participate in this demonstration that turned into a riot where there were a whole lot of injuries and and shop windows broken and looting and arson. And he came back to Holy Cross and he thought, my God, what have have I done? Look what my anger is leading me to, to this kind of destructiveness that is going to end up destroying me. And it certainly is going to diminish whatever I can be in life. And so he He prayed to be relieved of his anger, uh, and he asked himself, now hang on just a sec, Uh, 
do I believe in this hogwash that I have been spouting as a black radical, or do I really believe what the nuns taught me in my segregated Savannah school, that all men are created equal and that we are free to pursue our own happiness? And he said, you know what? I realized I actually did believe that. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I actually did believe that I was responsible for my own fate. And then all his subsequent experience kind of showed him that the, the, the tenets of black radicalism and radicalism generally were wrong. You know, for instance, he was a, he was an appeals prosecutor in Missouri for a while. Um, And, you know, he had believed that, well, blacks are in jail disproportionately because it's a racist system and, you know, they're all political prisoners, basically. And what he discovered looking at some of these appeals is that a black guy who forces a black lady to submit to rape and sodomy by holding a blade to her little boy's throat is not a victim. He's just a thug, Mm -hmm. and he ought to be in jail. Um, And then he went off by, you know, by dint of hard work, talent, and luck to uh, become a high civil rights official in the Reagan administration. And so he started looking at the numbers, and he started realizing that, just as affirmative action had harmed him because when he came out of law school, everybody thought, oh, well, here's an affirmative action black guy. Uh, he, must, he must have just gotten through on his race, not on his achievement or talent. So he could not get a job at first when he came out of law school. He said, look, this is what, this is what affirmative action is doing. It's consigning kids who are smart but unprepared to out-of-their-league schools where they're going to fail and become resentful. Um, And they're taking the successes like him and tarring them with the imputation of inferiority. That's no good whatsoever. And then he said, hey, and now let's look, as he was running these agencies, uh, let's look and see what happens when we force schools to integrate. Does it actually improve the performance of black kids? Isn't this what we're trying to do by by busing, let's say, mm-hmm. um, or forced integration? And he said, no, it does not. It does not improve their chances whatsoever. Or, and all it does is breed disharmony, resentment, anger, contempt, what have you. Uh, so he came he came to conclude, and then you can now read this in his jurisprudence, because um, there's a whole string of anti-affirmative action opinions that he wrote. Um, he said there is no benign discrimination by race. And actually, the Supreme Court made a big mistake in Brown v. Board of Education, the 1954 school desegregation decision, um, when it did not simply do what he would do, that when the Supreme – his view is that when a Supreme Court justice – sees a precedent that is incorrect, that does not really comport with the Constitution, he should say so and reverse it. He Mm -hmm. should overturn Mm -hmm. it. And so he looks at the 1857 Plessy v. Ferguson decision, which said that separate but equal facility for blacks in public accommodation is constitutional. And he says that's a monstrous decision, and the only thing good about it is the sole dissent of Justice John Marshall Harlan, who said our Constitution is colorblind and does not recognize or tolerate classes among citizens. The law regards man as man. Mm -hmm. And Thomas says, okay, so 60 years later, do we quote the majority decision or do we quote this lone dissent? We quote the dissent, and this is kind of the key to Thomas's own 27 years now on the on the court 28 years now almost um that that it is perfectly okay for supreme court justices to overturn precedent because even justices can be wrong and what we need to do is cleave to the constitution no matter what because it is the constitution Mm 
that is the law of the land, not any judicial construction of it. Talking to Myron Magnet, you're listening to Kirby Nation, the podcast of the Kirby World Show. His new book, Clarence Thomas and the Lost Constitution, available now. There's a link on the podcast page. I highly recommend the book. I We do a lot of book interviews, and there are a few books I really actually enjoy, and I enjoyed this one and learned quite a bit. One last question for you, Myron, again, we appreciate you taking time with us. Clarence Thomas is, I think since um, Justice Scalia passed away, he's possibly the most prominent conservative or originalist on the court. John Roberts is chief justice and sometimes strays. And you've got uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, who are relatively new, and Alito, who's near. Is he the leader of the originalist on the court? He's known for being quiet. He's known for not asking questions. He's known for writing good opinions, but just not being very active in the court in the public sphere when there are cases before them. Is he the leader of the originalists now in the court? He most, cert- he most certainly is, and he's highly influential in the court. And what is more, he has produced this wonderful flock of clerks um, whom he and his wife treat like children, like their own children. And 20% of the judges whom, uh, who the Trump administration has elevated to the federal bench are ex-Thomas clerks. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the Trump administration's deregulation czarina, who's just been put in, uh, 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 put in Brett Kavanaugh's seat on the D.C. Court of Appeals, mm-hmm. is another Thomas clerk. So his opinions which he has written for the ages, and he's perfectly, if he has to wait 60 years like John Marshall Harlan for his opinion to to be granted the law of the land, it's okay with him. He's writing for the ages, mm-hmm. and meanwhile, he's got all these young judges whom he's trained who absolutely share his views and who are going to be reshaping the law for generations to come in this country. And so I think that when historians look back on Clarence Thomas a hundred years from now, they are going to see that he was one of the great justices of our land. I would agree. The book is Clarence Thomas and the Lost Constitution. Mine Magnet, the author, also editor-in-chief of City Journal, which you should be reading. And then pick up the book when you get a chance. Myron, a great pleasure. Thanks for taking time with us today. Best of luck with the book, and I hope we get a chance to cross paths again. Thanks, Kirby. Always a pleasure. Welcome back to the 10 Blocks podcast. This is Brian Anderson, the editor of City Journal. Joining me on the show today is Myron Magnet, my predecessor as editor of City Journal, which he ran from 1994 through 2006. Myron is the magazine's editor-at-large and a frequent contributor. He's here today, though, to talk about his sparkling new book, Clarence Thomas and the Lost Constitution, and we're excited to bring our listeners a conversation about the life and legacy of Justice Thomas. We'll take a quick break, and we'll be back with Myron Magnet. Hello again, everyone. This is Brian Anderson, the editor of City Journal. Joining us in the studio is Myron Magnet. Myron's the magazine's editor-at-large these days, his former editor, and he's written a number of important books over the years. Dickens and the Social Order in 1985, The Dream and the Nightmare, the 60s Legacy to the Underclass in 1993, and in 2013, The Founders at Home. He's also the recipient of a National Humanities Medal awarded in 2008. But we're here today to talk about his new book, Clarence Thomas and the Lost Constitution. It's published by Encounter Books, and you can find a link on our website or buy it on Amazon. Myron, thanks very much for joining us. Such a pleasure to see you, as always, Brian. So let's start with the second part of the title of your book, The Lost Constitution. What do you mean by the Lost Constitution, and how was it lost? You describe... Uh, in your opening chapter, three waves or stages in the process going back to the 1870s. Yeah, but let's remember that the Framers' Constitution of 1787, let's remember what that was. The Framers thought of a very limited government, 
that because they were afraid that their government could turn into an elective despotism. So they wanted to make sure that the people who ran the government, who had the same human nature as everybody else, didn't turn from the servants of the people into their masters. So limits, limits, limits. They wanted to leave people free to do what Jefferson said, to pursue their own happiness in their own way in their families and communities. What has happened is that now it's become an unlimited constitution and we have the living constitution as defined by first Woodrow Wilson, in which the Supreme Court sits as a kind of permanent constitutional convention, making up the law as it goes along in a kind of Darwinian fashion, said Woodrow Wilson. And we have the administrative state supersized by Franklin Roosevelt. So the anger with which Americans view each other across party lines today is based in very large measure on this dichotomy. Half of us believe in the Freedom Party, the original Constitution. Half of us believe in the Fairness Party, the living Constitution. How did we get from one to the other, you properly ask? Three stages. One, the first overriding defect in the framers' 1787 Constitution was slavery. We fought a civil war over it, and then the nation tried to make it right for our new black citizens through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, making blacks full citizens and clothing them in all the privileges and immunities, all the rights of American citizens. Well, the whole country was waiting to see how the Supreme Court was going to construe this. And in, its, in two opinions in the 1870s, the Supreme Court said, notice that the privileges and immunities of national citizenship are different from those of state citizenship. And national citizenship gives you the right of such things as freedom to sail the high seas and interstate waterways. State citizenship is everything having to do with the rights of life, liberty, and property. And so that was kind of the end of the, of the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment, and it allowed Southerners to put blacks into serfdom and make a mockery of the death of 400,000 Union soldiers, essentially. That's the first step. The second step was Franklin Roosevelt, who decided that what he was going to do was set up an administrative state. He was going to set up a whole bunch of agencies that were going to be run by experts who were supposedly going to be nonpartisan. And the Congress would make some broad general command, such as markets are going to be fair. And we'll have a Securities and Exchange Commission who will set the rules for doing this. And even Franklin Roosevelt knew that, wait a minute, we've got these agencies that are making laws like a legislature, carrying them out like an executive, and adjudicating and punishing infractions like a judge. There's no separation of powers here. He said this is not really constitutional, but, you know, it's okay. We'll, the, the, we'll live with really it. This is really the idea of rule by experts, which Woodrow Wilson had, had uh, embraced as well in his view of the Constitution. And this right? is really what progressivism was, is rule by experts. They really believed in a kind of Hegelian uh, benign despotism. Mm -hmm. They did not believe in democracy. So those are the first two. What's the third stage of this movement away? The third is the Warren Court. Right, uh, in the 60s and 70s. In the 60s and 70s, and then everything that happened after it, because once Earl Warren oversaw Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, which met with such huge acclaim, the judges thought, wow, we're like the saviors of the republic. Everybody is waiting for us to cut these thorny issues like the Gordian knot, and we can do it, and off they went. Um, but the fact of the matter is, there is no basis either in something the, the Congress has said or the President has said uh, 
um, that gave the courts any right to make up law out of thin air. But that's what's been going on since 1964. 1954, I beg your pardon. Right. Uh, uh, Clarence Thomas, who's been on the court since his uh, very controversial and fraught confirmation in 1991, has established an enormous body of judicial opinions uh, since then that seek to push the court in the country back in a direction respect, respectful of the lost constitution or the constitution as understood by the framers. This is his originalist approach to judging, as it's called. Uh, I'd like to talk a bit about a few of the key areas where he has uh, exposed the kind of hubristic ju jurisprudence you've just described, the jurisprudence of the living constitution. So let's start with um, one of the areas in which he's written opinions, the Commerce Clause and how to interpret it. How has Thomas viewed the use of that clause to allow what has been an enormous expansion of federal power? Well, let's take one particular case, Gonzalez v. Rach. You know, the most zany opinion that the New Deal court passed was Wickard and Filburn. FDR wanted to get control of the whole economy. He had all these agricultural limits. Farmer Filburn grew grain to feed to his own animals, and the Agricultural Commission said, you can't do that, we're going to fine you. Um, because, no, you're not growing it to sell it. No, it doesn't cross state lines. No, it's not involved in commerce, but it affects commerce because you would otherwise have to buy your grain. Well, Thomas in Gonzales says, here's an analogous pay case, just like Wickard v. Filburn. We've got these two invalids in California who believe themselves protected by California's medical marijuana law. So they're growing marijuana to control their own pain for their own use. And Thomas says, this is not bought or sold. It does not cross state lines. It is not only not commerce, it's not even economic activity. And if you start down this line, you're going to be regulating potluck suppers next. So out right. it and goes. Uh, anything could be construed as af affecting the economy if that's how you're thinking about something so narrow. I mean, the funniest case actually was the first one um, in which... Uh, the idea was, does carrying a gun in a school zone um, substantially affect interstate commerce in that it makes it hard for students to learn, so therefore they'll be less productive? Um, right. I mean, so, so zany, in effect, zany. you're saying with, with these loose interpretations of the com Commerce Clause that there is no limit on federal power. No, and that's the thing that Madison was so worried about in framing the Constitution, that a, we should not turn a limited government into an unlimited government because that is tyranny. So Thomas has pushed back a little bit in some of his decisions on this, although those have been minority decisions, right? The, the Almost all of them. Yeah. Almost all of them, yes. Either dissents or concurrences in his colleagues' judgment, but not their reasons, usually because he rejects their precedents that they're relying on. Another um, area where Thomas has made a signal contribution is warning about the growth of the administrative agencies, which you, you discussed earlier, which are unaccountable to the public. In his view, their massive and expanding power has rested on unconstitutional foundations. Why does he think that, and has his conception made any headway on the court? So Thomas views the administrative state as flagrantly unconstitutional for a number of reasons. One is that the Constitution delegates all legislative power to the Congress, all judicial power to the courts and so on. And it is undelegatable. As Locke had said, you can, uh, legislators can make laws, they can't make legislators. But that's what administrative agencies do. When Congress sets up an EPA and says, make clean water, water and an EPA administrator makes rules that bind citizens, these are laws. If the EPA then says, 
you are you this business are infringing our regulations and we're going to fine you well they are i mean they have such a thing called an administrative law judge who examines this case but he's not accountable to the law or the constitution he's accountable to the administrative agency and so what we're doing here is mixing up legislative power and judicial power, and of course executive power, because it's the agencies that are doing the running of all of this. And this rides roughshod over the separation of powers that the framers thought as one of our principal protections against tyranny. And as Thomas says, it has no comfortable home in our constitutional structure. Um, So it's both the non-delegation part and the absolute abolition of the checks and balances implied in uh, the separation of powers that offends him so bitterly. Furthermore, of course, it's totally undemocratic. Who elected right. these administrators? And has, uh, has his uh, um, conception made headway on the court? Yes, it has. The court is now beginning to look at some of the decisions such as the Chevron decision, um, which on, on which the administrative state rests. And Justice Kavanaugh has been a very big questioner of the administrative state. With him on the court, there is going to be now another stalwart anti-administrative state justice. And by the way, replacing Kavanaugh on the Second Circuit is the astonishing Naomi Rao, who was Donald Trump's deregulation czarina. And so she is the queen of anti-administration, administrative statism. So I think that the courts are going to be much more sensitive to the need to, to draw some of this stuff back. One of, um, one of the most important uh, areas, obviously, central to his concern uh, for Thomas is the constitutionality or lack thereof of racial, of racial preferences. Um, how, how does he think about affirmative action and uh, the court's approach to race in general? Well, there's a series of cases on this topic which led Juan Williams of the Washington Post and Fox News and so on to say that Justice Thomas is our nation's foremost thinker on race. And what, I mean, after a look at, here's Thomas, who grew up in segregated Savannah. He says, hey, I have a personal stake in this. I grew up under segregation as a poor black kid in the Savannah slums. Um, And uh, as a guy who, after Holy Cross and the Yale Law School, couldn't get a real law job uh, because he was tarred with the taint of affirmative action. And people assumed that, oh, well, Yale Law just let him in uh, for a quota, not because he was talented. So he says, in a variety of cases, there's no such a thing as benign discrimination by race. Who's to decide if it's benign or not? That's thing one. He says, you know, actually, he goes back to Brown v. Board, 1954, that's where the Warren Court got started. Um, And he says, Brown v. Board, even though we agree with the idea that schools shouldn't be segregated by law, was wrongly decided. The courts have no business making this huge policy decision. And furthermore, they made it on totally specious grounds of social science that it had to do with the feelings of black kids who were supposedly made to feel inferior by this. He said, this is hocus pocus. It has nothing to do with law, nothing to do with the Constitution. And the important point is the point that the first Justice John Marshall Harlan made in his dissent in Plessy v. Ferguson at the end of the 19th century. Harlan said... It is not okay to, d- to have separate but equal facilities for blacks and whites because 
our Constitution is colorblind and makes no distinction between classes. So what Thomas says is that's the way the court should have, that's the way the court, that's the way the Congress should have looked at the whole question of racial discrimination. And what we ended up doing in Brown is this sort of push-me-pull-you decision where the court said, in the special case of education, racial discrimination is not acceptable. But it didn't actually overturn Plessy v. Ferguson, even though an awful lot of legal commentators believed that it did. We should have done that. Okay, so we're still discriminating by race. We are discriminating positively by race, supposedly, in the case of affirmative action. But that ought to be illegal because the Constitution shouldn't be considering race. And by the way, did anybody ever ask, did this have a good effect on the supposed beneficiaries of affirmative action? He never says, hey, look at me. I couldn't get a job because I... I was branded as an affirmative action quota. Um, But he says, you know, you take kids who are smart but unprepared and put them in situations where they're going to fail, and they end up becoming sullen, angry, they fail, they drop out, when otherwise they would have succeeded. So instead of advancing black Americans, you are retarding them And instead of making for racial harmony, you're making for racial dissension. And the court's role in this has been toxic, and the justices ought to stop it. We we can't talk about everything covered in your extremely lucid discussion of Thomas's thinking in the book, but I'd like to touch on uh, one further one, and that's free speech. Thomas has been one of the court's strongest defenders of the First Amendment He's he's really almost a First Amendment absolutist, right? He is. So could you just sketch out um, some of the areas in which he's uh, he's written opinions um, that have touched on free speech issues? Sure. There's there's sort of two large areas that were thought to be distinct, commercial speech and political speech. Um, And first he started with commercial speech. uh, And in a series of opinions... He started out by saying, sure, uh, uh, commercial speech is less important than non-commercial speech. Um, So we can be faster and looser with it. But then he came to say, wait a minute, we live in a free enterprise society. And that's crucial to our identity as America. And in a free enterprise society, citizens need to have all possible information in order to make intelligent decisions and intelligent choices in the economic realm. So, for instance, if a liquor store wants to advertise its prices, that's, of course, protected by the First Amendment speech protection. Um, Now, he says the main First Amendment speech protection is political speech because in a free democratic society, there needs to be this lively, combative marketplace of ideas in which citizens can decide, do I want this vision for our country or do I want that vision? Well, the thing about campaign finance reform is that it is profoundly anti-political free speech. He says, you know, it paints itself as something beatific, It's not. It's absolutely not. Its history is squalid. The first campaign finance bill was backed by a KKK murderer, Senator Tillman of South Carolina, in 1907. Um, The McCain-Feingold Act is basically tainted by Senator McCain's extreme embarrassment about being involved in a savings and loan you know, being involved helping a savings and loan fraudster. And what what campaign finance says it can do is regulate speech by regulating the money that candidates spend or that contributors, whether individuals or corporations or unions, can give to candidates. Well, this is all political speech. This is what the First Amendment is principally about, and we should not be regulating it whatsoever, not at all. 
Um, so he would do away with all campaign finance limits, um, and he certainly is happy to get rid of of, uh, of McCain Feingold. And in Citizens United, when you know he writes a concurrence in Citizens United, he says, "Absolutely, of course, there should be." Well, let me go. Let me go back one step. He said, "You know, the trouble." With these campaign finance, uh, with these campaign finance limitations, is that you're pretty soon going to get to say that publishing companies and networks are corporations. Well, they are, right? They are, and so if they are giving interviews to John, right. but not Hillary, that's a kind of campaign contribution, and we can regulate them. And in the in the oral argument in one of these cases, um, one of the justices asked the solicitor general who was arguing for the government, are you saying that if in a 800-page book there were one sentence criticizing a candidate that the government could ban the book? And the solicitor general said, yes, I am saying that. And the justice said, well, that's pretty incredible. Um, and that turned the court against that idea of campaign finance. And so we get, get to Citizens United where, sure, there can be corporate contributions, there can be union contributions, there can be, there can be PAC contributions. And, but, but Thomas concurs in Citizens United, but he goes on to make one further point, and he says – there should be no disclosure requirements. You know, that's supposed to be another purity right. uh, provision. And he says, but the trouble with these disclosure requirements is just look what happened in California when California tried to make a law, tried to make a law saying that marriage was between a man and a woman. All the people who contributed to that campaign had their names put up on the Internet, their addresses mapped on the Internet, people picketed their houses, picketed their workplaces, guys got fired for it, businesses got put out of businesses for it. So he said, you think that this doesn't have a chilling effect on speech? Uh, he said, just as the government cannot forbid speech, it cannot compel speech. And to force a citizen to disclose his name, especially, he says, and I love this because this, he really knows his, his pre-revolutionary American history. He said, in a country where the revolution started with anonymous pamphleteering, right. what is the court doing saying mm -hmm. you, have to make, you have to make political statements and attach your name to them? Uh, so he, he, he really is an absolutist on this topic. And uh, the court is moving in Thomas's direction on campaign finance. For sure. Ruling. And the further it moves, the better. Because here's the thing. One of the things that Thomas said is in one of these decisions is, you know, implicit in the reasoning behind some of the earlier pro-campaign finance decisions is the idea that courts have the – proper duty to equalize voices between the propertied and the unpropertied. Well, that's James Madison's nightmare. James Madison said that the tyranny of the majority will take the form of the unpropertied many getting a hold of the property of the few. So that the most important thing that you have to protect is the right of money to talk, at least to make a case for itself. So the idea that corporations, because they are profit-making enterprises, shouldn't be able to spend the money to say, hey, what we're doing is good, is helping America by creating jobs, by creating wealth. Of course they ought to be allowed to do that. And Thomas is fervent in his belief in that. This is a, a narrower question about Thomas's interpretive approach. How does he view precedent, uh, one current of constitutional thought, including some in the conservative uh, camp, uh, says that judges need to be restrained in their dealing with precedent, that they have to respect precedent. Um, Thomas isn't in that camp, right? He's a real bomb thrower, Brian. Yeah. Um, 
This, there is a hallowed doctrine among the lawyers and law professors called stare decisis, respect precedent. And Thomas says that's the wrong question. The right question is quo waranto, by what authority? So he says, we, the Supreme, you know, he says, of course, lower court judges have to respect precedent. They take an oath to do that. But we Supreme Court justices take an oath to uphold the Constitution. And we do not hesitate to invalidate laws duly passed by the people's elected representatives and signed by the President of the United States. So if our predecessors have been wrong, as in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson, for example, right? Uh, Or as in the case of Dred Scott. How can we have any higher respect for these or in the case of those early 14th Amendment decisions, which were obscene? Why should we respect them? Why should we do this dance around them as if they were sacrosanct? They're wrong. They're mistaken. We should say so. And the lawyers and law professors say, oh, my God, what will happen to settled law? Well, I mean, we've managed to – the judges have overturned precedents in the past. The Congress has passed laws and had them repealed. We managed. There have been enormous changes in what Congress has done and what the courts have done. The country adjusts. It will adjust. And Thomas is not worried about that. What he is worried about is the piling of error upon error upon error until we get to what looks like a legal order but is an illegitimate order in which we do not have self-government but in which we have government by men, not by laws. A concluding question, Um, your, your book includes a short but moving narrative of Thomas's life and education, which the judge himself has famously chronicled in his memoir, My Grandfather's Son. Can you talk a little bit about that and how it might have influenced Thomas's view of the world, his, uh, his approach to the court? Oh, I could talk about it for the rest of the day, Brian, because the book is wonderful. Um, and one of the points that I make in this book is that it is essential for a free people to have a particular kind of self-reliant character, both national and individual. And we have to have a culture that breeds that character, which we don't do when we have all these snowflakes in colleges uh, or we have all these resentful, dependent uh, people who are who are saying, well, I've been victimized by society. I can't make my own way. Thomas was sent by his divorced mother, who couldn't make ends meet, to live with his grandfather when he was a little boy. Um, and so he went from a from this this uh, squalid Savannah slum uh, to a clean well-run household, uh, his mother's father and his mother's stepfather and his mother's stepmother uh, basically brought him and his younger brother up and they brought him up with the strictest kind of child rearing that bred self-reliance and self-confidence incidentally. And Thomas and th- his grandfather had this huge stock of maxims. Where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, old man can't is dead. I helped bury him. And he would he put the, his business. He he was a he was a self-made if semi-literate businessman. He built this fuel oil delivery business. Modest, modest, but independence. He put the boys to work delivering oil when they were in third grade, after school and on weekends. At the same time, the family owned 60 acres across from where the family had been enslaved. And he and the two boys, two grandsons, built a house together on these acres, cleared and tilled the land, and they went there every summer and lived, as Thomas says, an off-grid experience, right? Uh, 
uh, in which he learned to be dependent on nobody. They grew their own food. They raised their own livestock. They slaughtered it. They stored it for the winter. Uh, you know, they lived off what they grew themselves. It was like living. And he says, and this is what life is like. You're crossing the prairie of life on your own. You're on your own. And that's how it ought to be. You need to take responsibility for yourself. Make no excuses. The great problem with modern culture, he believes, is that instead of valuing heroes like his grandfather, he came to think, we now focus all the time on victims. The idea is that there are all these vast forces out there which the individual can't surmount. He needs an immense government to protect him from those forces. And once you start thinking that way, once you start thinking that, oh, I am not the person who forges my own fate, I'm going to leave the government to do it. When you start thinking, I'm not the person who's responsible for my own community, for its order, for its beauty, for its enlightenment, the government is going to do that, you cease to be a free society. And that is the great danger that he sees us facing. And that is the great danger that honestly faces us as a nation right now. How are we going to be free citizens who maintain a free country? Don't forget to check out Myron Magnet's new book, Clarence Thomas and the Lost Constitution. We'll link to it in the description and on our website. You can follow Myron on Twitter, at Myron Magnet. You can also find City Journal on Twitter, at City Journal, and now Instagram, at City Journal underscore MI. And always, if you like what you heard on the podcast, please show us some love and rate us on iTunes. Thanks for listening, and thanks very much, Myron, for joining us. Thanks for joining us for the weekly 10 Blocks podcast featuring urban policy and cultural commentary with City Journal editors, contributors, and special guests. It's just, it's just